My name is Eric Armbrecht. I'm a professor at the St. Louis University Center for Health Outcomes Research in the School of Medicine. Um, I do mostly chronic disease uh, management uh, research. Jill? Oh, and I have no, I have no, uh, no conflict of interest. My name is Jill Johnson, and I'm a pharmacist and professor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Pharmacy, and no changes in Hi, good morning. I'm Bizan Bora. I'm a professor of health services research at the Mayo Clinic uh, College of Medicine, and I don't have any uh, conflict of interest. Uh, Don Casey, an internist uh, on the faculty of Rush in Chicago, University of Minnesota Institute for Healthcare and Informatics in Jefferson College of Population Health. No monetary conflicts. I am one of the co-authors of both the ACCHA, DCC, and STEMI, NSTX, um, and ST Elevation MI guidelines and focus studies. Uh, hi, Timothy Wilt. I'm a general internist, health services researcher at the Minneapolis VA healthcare system and University of Minnesota. Uh, I have no conflicts. Good morning, uh, Greg Kerfman, deputy editor, JAMA. Uh, no other conflicts of interest. Hi, I'm Timothy McBride, I'm a professor at the Brown School at Washington University. Uh, the one thing I probably should have mentioned on my conflicts of interest, I, I, I am um, on the Health Policy Advisory Committee for Centene Corporation. Thank you. Good morning, Scott Misak, uh, pharmacist and professor at St. Louis College of Pharmacy, and I have no conflicts to disclose. I'm Rachel Sachs. I'm an associate professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis, and I have no conflicts to disclose. I'm Kurt Vandenbosch, I'm pharmacist with St. Louis Health System in Idaho, and I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, Stuart Winston. I'm a cardiologist, cardiac electrophysiologist uh, based in Ann Arbor, clinically retired patient advocate, patient experience consultant. I have no conflicts. Thank you, everybody. Um, just so, so you know, we'll do uh, the same tradition or custom we had in the past. If we have questions as a group, we can turn our uh, name tags on the vertical, and then we'll be able to uh, call on you and uh, get a really good discussion going today. I'd like to turn it over to Steve, um, who will uh, walk us through the next part of the meeting in terms of presentations of clinical evidence and uh, the economic models. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. So. We always start by just a, a brief kind of stepping back and saying, so why are we here today? What are the purposes of today's meeting? Um, and I'd like to start with a, a quote from a, a patient with cardiovascular disease who told us, everyone in my family is afraid I will have another heart attack. I do everything I can to manage my disease, but I always feel like I'm waiting for the worst to happen because I know it can ha at any time. What this quote reflects is just part of the, the clinical uh, landscape that we face with cardiovascular disease. It's the number one um, cause of mortality in the United States. And many, many patients suffer um, either with a high risk of a future cardiac event or cardiovascular event, or they've had one and they're wondering when the next one will come. So treatments to address this as a clinical um, issue have been um, sorely needed for, for many, many years. And we're here in part because of this blend of or kind of con combining of the patient need and new innovation. So with innovation, when we have a new drug, which is just part of what we can do for patients with cardiovascular disease, what happens the day that these treatments are approved at the FDA is that patients and doctors frequently rejoice because there's now another option on the table. Also what happens is that payers start to meet, or they've already been meeting usually for some time, to think about how they will design coverage policy. The drug makers, the innovators who've brought this treatment, they have been thinking also for years, but when it happens, FDA approval, they announce the price. And all of this happens in a very concentrated, relatively focused amount of time around FDA approval. Doesn't mean that things are set in stone forever, but a lot of the initial thinking that helps guide clinicians, patients, payers, and manufacturers around the pricing, those are discussions that happen around the time of FDA approval. 
So the historical context is that given that all this needs to happen, especially when there are treatments that are either foreseen as being very expensive or in the aggregate, given the number of potential patients to treat, might be expensive to the system. There can be special tensions that can lead to problems with access, that can lead to real issues, again, around how we price and how we make available new innovations in the healthcare system. This leads far too often to the difficulty of patients to get um, appropriate access to the drugs that can help them, while again, the system broadly stated, including manufacturers, payers, clinicians, and others, struggle with some of the balance between evidence and value. So the goals for today's meeting are to try to look back at that evidence and to try to view it with the input of clinical experts, with the input from the patient perspective, and with the Midwest CPAC here as an independent group without conflicts that can talk about the evidence as a foundation for our thinking about how to manage that, the right balance, if you will, between access, cost, and innovation. So you've met the members of the Midwest Comparative Effect from this Public Advisory Council. And uh, just briefly, ICER, which serves as the academic kind of secretariat and also the convener for today's meeting. We are an independent, not-for-profit research institute based in Boston. We keep our funding updated on our website. Here's a current snapshot of it. And as you can see, the majority of our overall revenue comes from nonprofit foundations. The chief funder within that set of groups is the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. We also get funding from uh, the California Health Care Foundation, from the Commonwealth Fund, and from the National Institute of Healthcare Management. You can see also we have a very small sliver still of government grants and contracts, and we have a separate uh, set of funding for our policy summit activities in which we take direct contributions from health plans and provider groups and manufacturers that are kept for that separate set of activities and are not used to support the research that goes into the reports that are the focus of these public meetings. So the report itself, which serves in a sense as both the conceptual and the, the practical background for today's meeting, was developed over almost eight months. And it starts with a scoping phase at the beginning where we reach out to patient groups, to clinical experts, to manufacturers and other stakeholders to try to get the perspective that we need on what the key questions are where the best evidence is, what we can learn from patients about the experience and the diversity of need. Following that early scoping, we dive deep into a, an evidence analysis that's led by the ICER staff. And we also start to work with, usually with outside um, academic colleagues to develop a cost effectiveness model. Today's model was developed by researchers at the University of Colorado, and they'll be introduced subsequently. The report goes through several versions of uh, public comment and revision, and we had specifically um, identified clinical expert reviewers for today's report, and they are Dr. Robert Harrington, uh, professor of medicine at Stanford, and Dr. Pat O'Gara, who's um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard. So the evidence itself in this report is structured conceptually to try to meet a common goal that stakeholders have, certainly patients do. It's a fair price for them and for the system, fair access, and a structure and pricing and rewards process and structure that can suit future innovation. The report provides evidence to support that goal that's kind of separated into segments that are more focused on long-term value for money and others that are focused more on the short-term affordability. The long-term value for money is itself a complex conceptual bucket in which we think there are important kind of components. The first is a clear-eyed look at the evidence on comparative clinical effectiveness. What do the studies tell us? What additional information can we glean to help us understand the comparative clinical effectiveness? Then we have the incremental cost effectiveness based on the model that tries to take that early evidence and spin it out over the long term so that we can make sure to capture the long term value of innovation. We also have two important areas that we call other benefits or disadvantages and contextual considerations. These are to acknowledge that there are very important 
aspects of value that may lie outside of what we can capture in clinical trials. These other benefits or disadvantages, as you'll see when we come to the discussion and vote, are things such as benefits to the patient and their family around how it impacts their ability to work, their, you know, their expenses at home to take care of patients, and broader aspects of value around how choice of different kinds of innovations, different kinds of treatments can be helpful to patients and their families and the healthcare system. Contextual considerations often involve some of the ethical issues that we bring to the table. We want to think about how severe conditions are, whether the health gains we are finding there um, have particular relevance for historical or other reasons. So when we look at all that, that sums up into a way of thinking about long-term value for money, and we'll be talking about all of them today. We also will talk, the report discusses some of the aspects of potential budget impact, especially important when there is a very large, potentially eligible patient population. We'll handle most of this discussion during the policy roundtable because there's no specific vote on affordability, but it will certainly figure into the policy making aspects of these new interventions. So with that, the agenda for today, we'll be starting off with the presentation of the evidence. We will have a, an ability to have manufacturers give public comments with discussion with the CPAC. Then there will also be a segment where we can have public comments and further discussion. Lunch will be at noon. And Ellie, are, is there lunch available for people who are attending or do they have options in the, all right, well, Ellie will probably tell us that later. Um, then we'll come back for further deliberation and the vote by the Midwest CPAC on the questions related to clinical effectiveness and value. And after a short break, again, we'll convene a policy roundtable dis discussion with representatives from the patient community, from clinical experts, the manufacturers, and payers. Following brief reflections from the CPAC, we'll adjourn at or before 4 o'clock. Now, before we begin, I want to also introduce our clinical experts and patient community representatives who will be part of the discussion today. And we have with us Jeremy Sussman, who's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan Medical School. And I'll just ask you to confirm you have no conflicts to disclose. Thank you. And Dr. Jason Waspy, who's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, um, and director of quality and outcomes research at the Mass General Hospital, and has other roles there as well. Um, and Jason, you can go ahead and, if you don't mind, you've received speaking fees for participation at the IEGAR conference sponsored by Biotronic. Any specific conflicts related to the uh, treatments and the companies involved today? Uh, yeah, that's not uh, pertinent, I, and, and there are no pertinent issues to this topic. All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, patient experts, we are very pleased to welcome Andrea Baer. Actually, I'll let you folks introduce yourselves. Andrea, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Great, thank you. Uh, I am the executive director of Mended Hearts, and um, we do have, we, we have received funding from Janssen and AstraZeneca, um, but it is not relative to today's discussions or the, the medications that we're discussing today. And Andrea, tell us just a little bit about Mended Hearts. Yeah. About Mended Hearts? Yeah. Yeah, we are a nonprofit national organization that works in local communities serving about 300 hospitals across the country to provide peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and um, advocacy for patients uh, who have heart disease across a lifespan. So we serve families whose children have congenital heart disease all the way through the lifespan um, through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer education. Great, thank you, and thank you for being here. And Marie Warshauer, who's a support network program director with Women Heart. Also, please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Marie Warshauer. I'm based in Chicago. Women Heart is based in Washington, D.C. I, we are an organization that focuses purely on women with heart disease, all varieties. We educate, we work on advocacy, and try to just spread the word about women and heart disease. I am a heart disease champion. And um, happy to be here, and I have no conflicts. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, let me again introduce David Rand, our Chief Medical Officer, to take us through the clinical evidence. I, I just want to say it's been that sort of trip so far. We had various lift rides to the airport and to dinner that were interesting. So 
various things going on. So, uh, and also the fact that I'm here doing this, um, I'm here because Dan Ollendorf, who's the evidence author on this report, has a family emergency, and so he isn't presenting this, and so I'm presenting as well. And so if I'm looking over desperately at various people to uh, help out with evidence questions, uh, you'll know why that's going on. Uh, this is the group that worked on this, including uh, Catherine Fazioli, Serena Heron-Smith, Patty Sinat. Um, none of the ICER group, including myself, has any uh, disclosures, nor does Dan Ollendorf, other than uh, receiving money from ICER to do the work on this report. Um, cardiovascular disease, uh, just for definitional purposes, you know, we're talking about multiple vascular beds, potentially, the coronary bed, peripheral arterial disease, cerebrovascular disease. Um, in those situations, you have risks of angina, claudication, MI, stroke. Uh, about one half of all adults in the U.S. have some form of cardiovascular disease. It's the leading cause of death in the U.S. across all races and ethnicities, 850,000 deaths annually. Obviously, the potential for long-term disability, uh, both from MI with things like heart failure, from stroke, uh, large financial burden, $350 billion in direct and indirect costs expected to exceed a trillion dollars by 2035. Uh, the standard of care management of cardiovascular disease typically involves um, behavioral and lifestyle modifications, diet, exercise, smoking cessation, uh, control of uh, hypertension and diabetes, aspirin, statins, uh, other newer medications aimed at cardiovascular risk, potentially, including PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, some of the medications for diabetes, including the GLP-1 um, receptor agonists and the uh, uh, SGLT2 drugs that people are starting to use. Despite all the things we might consider for this, many patients are at high residual risk for events. So the scope of this review uh, is looking at a couple of different populations. One is adults with cardiovascular disease who are currently receiving optimal medical management, so known cardiovascular disease. And the other is adults without known cardiovascular disease but at elevated risk due to age and comorbidity. And for there, we're talking about, and you'll see that we're saying Vasipa on the slides here. This is icosapentethyl. Uh, just for pronunciation purposes, we're saying Vasipa. Uh, on the slides and during the meeting. Um, but uh, age, comorbidity, you'll see what was studied there, but we're talking primarily about patients with diabetes, 50 and older with an additional risk factor for those who do not have known cardiovascular disease, and then also in people with known cardiovascular disease. So looking first at rivaroxaban, uh, this is a factor 10A inhibitor. Uh, initially indicated, like the other direct-acting oral anticoagulants, for atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolic events. Uh, and then uh, it has had an indication, I guess, for over a year now for use in combination with aspirin to re reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, MACE, um, in patients with known um, coronary artery disease and or peripheral arterial disease. Uh, it was compared to aspirin alone. It was also compared to rivaroxaban alone, but we're going to focus on the aspirin alone comparison since rivaroxaban alone uh, didn't get this indication. Uh, and we're also uh, going to uh, go through our attempt to compare it to dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, which is aspirin plus a drug such as clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Um, then we're also going to look at Vasipa. Uh, an ethyl ester of, and if you thought icosapentethyl was hard, icosapentanoic acid, EPA. Um, current indication for that medication has been for the reduction of triglyceride levels in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia, um, but uh, it is now up for approval for being used to, again, reduce risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, and it was... <laughs> Uh, studied as an addition to optimal medical management in patients on statins almost entirely, uh, in those with established cardiovascular disease, those with known cardiovascular disease but age 50, without known cardiovascular disease but with age 50 and older, with diabetes plus one additional risk factor. Um, 
and uh, patients had triglyceride levels uh, of 135 to 499, and in LDL on treatment, typically between 40 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, for those of you who aren't used to triglyceride levels, 135 is not very elevated. That's a pretty low elevation of triglycerides, but so it was studied over a pretty wide range of triglyceride levels. And the comparison uh, there is to optimal medical management alone, uh, meaning uh, as estimated by the placebo arm of the clinical trial we're going to talk about. Outcomes of interest, obviously, uh, mortality, both cardiovascular and all-cause, uh, non-fatal MI and stroke, and those first three, not including all-cause mortality, but cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke make up what's sometimes called hard MACE, or MACE as it's evaluated sometimes. And then unstable angina and revascularization uh, is five-point MACE, or MACE including softer endpoints. Uh, cardiovascular hospitalization, health-related quality of life, and then uh, remember that rivaroxaban was looked at in patients with peripheral arterial disease, and so major adverse limb events, which was um, abbreviated MAIL and is used on at least a couple of the slides, although I can't say that's an abbreviation I ever saw before uh, working on this. We need um, first ever. <laughs> no, we also need first ever, then we'll have female. Ah. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, uh, and the harm of primary interest, uh, particularly with rivaroxaban and its comparators, is major bleeding events. Um, Insights from discussions with both patients and uh, clinicians, uh, adherence challenges given the high levels of uh, comorbidities so if these patients are on drugs for multiple conditions and just cardiovascular disease has a lot of polypharmacy. Uh, increased uh, financial burden from additive therapies. Um, the need for better discussions between patients and clinicians about trade-offs on risks and benefits. And then we heard from clinicians um, cautious optimism about these therapies. Uh, with rivaroxaban, the balance of bleeding risks and cl versus clinical benefits. And then uh, for um, both drugs, inconsistent findings for other anticoagulants and for other omega-3 preparations. Uh, so for rivaroxaban, we're mainly looking at the COMPASS trial. And this was a study looking, as you see, at rivaroxaban at quite a low dose in combination with aspirin, uh, at an intermediate dose alone and um, versus aspirin alone. And again, we're going to focus on just the one versus three comparison on that slide. Um, these patients, 91% had coronary disease. 27% had PAD, so we're talking about 9% of people who had PAD alone. Most of the PAD patients also had cardiovascular disease, had coronary artery disease. Um, many of them had had a prior MI, a few of them had had a prior stroke, recent stroke was an exclusion. And the primary outcome was the composite of hard MACE. Um, with the combination of rivaroxaban plus aspirin, there was a 24% reduction uh, in hard mace. Uh, there were, con that, that level of reduction was consistent across other outcomes, including cardiovascular mortality, 22% reduction, all-cause mortality, which you wouldn't expect to be as lowered as cardiovascular mortality, 18% reduction. I, I mention all that because sometimes therapies that we've looked at for cardiovascular disease have shown reductions in cardiovascular events and sometimes even in cardiovascular mortality but have had no effect on all-cause mortality and you're wondering where the people are dying that weren't dying from the cardiovascular things. These numbers look like what you'd expect. Um, reduction in stroke looked better. Uh, I don't have up there that there was a non-significant with wide confidence intervals increase in hemorrhagic stroke but that would be expected with anticoagulant therapy. So even though we don't have large numbers to answer that, it's probably believable. This trial was stopped early for benefit uh, with 23 months of mean follow-up, and we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that later. Um, 
EQ5D, quality of life data, were collected, but we don't have those available yet. Uh, and then various uh, subgroups like renal disease, no renal disease, heart failure, no heart failure were looked at, and the benefits were consistent across subgroups. This was a very, this is the result this trial showed in the various ways it was looked at. Uh, in terms of major bleeding, and the definitions of major bleeding vary across trials in ways that made life difficult for us in this review, and in this used a somewhat quirky definition, um, but there was an increase in major bleeding uh, with rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, 70% increase. Again, not surprising. You're giving an anticoagulant on top of an antiplatelet agent. Uh, there were no statistically significant differences in fatal bleeding or symptomatic intracranial bleeding. Uh, they presented an analysis of net clinical benefit where you kind of put all that stuff into one number and said you had a 20% reduction. Um, I would just say, remember, that it can be hard to trade these things off. Uh, in a lot of cases, you might care less about a bleed than about a stroke or MI. But as we've done more and more treatment with other therapies, lots of strokes and MIs are quite minor. MIs can sometimes be a chemical event that the patient almost doesn't know happened. And so then, if you're talking about a major bleed versus that, the trade-off might go in the other direction. Uh, this is a network meta-analysis we did to try to compare um, rivaroxaban plus aspirin to dual antiplatelet therapy, which means aspirin plus a drug in the class of ticagrelor or clopidogrel, which is a very common therapy that's used after an MI, particularly when a stent has been placed. Um, Similarly, when you give two antiplatelet agents, you increase the risk of bleeding. This was a hard comparison to do. It was indirect through the comparison arms of the trials. And where we did not trust on the harm side that we had adequate information to compare bleeding rates. You can just see on this that on reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events, Rivaroxaban doesn't have a statistically significant difference from either of the dual antiplatelet therapies, but with wide confidence intervals, so it's hard to be sure about this. And it's really hard to be sure on the bleeding side. So um, controversies and uncertainties with rivaroxaban. Um, the compass entry criteria were focused on patients at high event risk but excluded people at high bleeding risk. That's unlikely to look like the real world where many of the same people with high event risk will have high bleeding risk. Um, the trial was stopped early for benefit. When you stop a trial early for benefit, you've likely increased or overstated the benefit on which you stopped the trial. You have not made it more likely that you stopped it when there was no benefit. The statistical protection against that works, but the actual point estimate uh, can be inflated. So know that as you're looking at uh, these numbers. Uh, as we mentioned, um, we have problems with bleeding definitions. In this one, uh, if there were multiple major bleeding events, uh, there were situations in which this looked mainly at the most severe event, and so we weren't, in all cases, counting up every bleeding event in people who were bleeding. Um, and as mentioned, there were differences in the bleeding definitions in such a way that uh, we really didn't think we could compare um, on the bleeding side to dual antiplatelet therapy. Moving over to icosapentaphyl, the SEPA, uh, we primarily pretty much only have the reduce it trial. This is um, a 4.9 year trial. Um, it had these patients, again, the, the secondary prevention are the ones with known cardiovascular disease. Primary prevention are these high risk patients with diabetes, 50 and older, uh, one additional risk factor. The primary outcome was the five point MACE, so including the two softer MACE endpoints. Uh, also looked at serious bleeding. Fish oil has occasionally caused slight increases in bleeding, and that's relevant to these results. Um, 
So the composite endpoint there, the five-point mace, was reduced by 25%. Similarly, hard mace was reduced by 26%. Primary prevention reduction was 19%. Secondary production was 28%. Overlapping confidence intervals. You can see in primary prevention, the confidence interval isn't statistically significant, smaller population. Uh, but again, everything's looking very consistent there. Um, reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 20% reduction. MI, 30% reduction. Stroke, 29% reduction. All-cause mortality, 13% reduction. Uh, not statistically significant. Um, again, you often don't see in clinical trials for MI this level of consistency across endpoints. So there's nothing about the way all that looks as was, and again, this was true with rivaroxaban, nothing about the way all that looks that's particularly concerning. So as you look at those sorts of outcomes, it just, this drug seems to do this across the various groups. Um, again, remember, this was a study that included people with elevated triglyceride levels, 135 to 499. And one question, one important question that we faced was whether we were going to talk about this drug in terms of people with elevated triglycerides. Here, um, you have the breakdown. The top two rows are above and below 150. The next two rows are above and below 200. And if you go to the hard mace outcome, you can see, you, you can see that these are a little bit different in different directions. But there's no hint there that having a low triglyceride level makes your hard mace outcomes have a worse reduction. If anything, you'd go, oh, it looks like a little better reduction. And the numbers are very similar for mace reduction above and below um, on the five-point mace. And the 150, I mean, again, less than 150, that's not a very high triglyceride elevation. So I think you can say going into this study, the people doing the study thought that I think that they were going to have an effect because of their effect on triglycerides. But there's very little in the data to suggest that that's what happened. Um, and we'll come back to that. In terms of uh, the SEPA harms, uh, there was uh, a trend towards uh, more serious bleeding, uh, that, but it wasn't statistically significant. Again, I would guess that's probably true. Fish oil has had some increases in, in bleeding in other studies. Uh, there were statistically higher rates of hospitalization for AFib and flutter, and also uh, for AFib overall. Um, I don't think they were expecting that. I think they were focusing on AFib because there had been other studies of fish oil that had suggested it might decrease AFib. Uh, it's hard to know what to make of that. Uh, in terms of controversies and uncertainties, um, there's been a lot of talk after this trial about the placebo arm. The placebo arm was a mineral oil pill. And there's some suggestion that the mineral oil led to increases in LDL and raised uh, CRP levels. Uh, in each case, not by an amount that would suggest you'd see a big increase in events, but uh, it was thought that maybe the mineral oil was interfering with absorption of statins, and maybe that's what's going on. The level of LDL increase, if that was due to decrease in absorption of statins, would be the difference between pretty similar doses of statins that in trials of statins have very similar effects on reducing events. The idea that you could have a 25% reduction go away because of this does not seem believable in any way. You know, if you wanted to say, gee, it might really be a 23% reduction or a 24% reduction, maybe. I, I don't think if that's the reason, um, that could be what's going on. If mineral oil that many people were given as children and that people have been given in many different ways really dramatically increases the risk of MI, then I guess this could be going on. Um, that would be scary. You know, I, I, presumably people haven't thought that's what's going on because mineral oil hasn't been pulled off the shelves. Um, the manufacturer, uh, the 
the researchers did a total events analysis. And this may or may not come up on public comments, but um, they implied that when you looked at all events, rather than first event, um, that there were bigger reductions in event, ra in event rates. The reason people tend to do first event calculations is that you get correlations on events. Um, so somebody who's had an MI is more likely to get revascularized. Somebody who, uh, so that once those correlations start occurring, you can get into trouble and the methods that were used to try to adjust for that, we weren't comfortable with, and we think it's safer to assume that the hazard ratio for first events is also the hazard ratio reduction that you'd see for future events. It's just hard to be sure of that. Um, we have these impressive results from Reduce It, and yet other studies of fish oils have been negative over and over and over and over again. Um, and it's not entirely clear what happened here. Um, Vasipa is a higher dose. It's EPA, it's not combined DHA EPA, so it's a different fish oil. Um, but it's at least somewhat worrisome that other trials have been negative and this one was positive. On the reassuring side, there was a trial published in 2006 or 2007, the JELIS trial, J-E-L-I-S, um, that was done in Japan with an EPA preparation. Very different population. The Japanese eat way more fish and have higher levels of fish oil in them originally. It was at a different dose. And it had reductions in cardiovascular events. It didn't actually have any reduction in all cause in mortality but it did decrease uh, cardiovascular events. And that's sort of the best argument that um, there's prior evidence to support the idea that this fish oil may be different because the JELIS trial really did have similar sort of differences uh, from other trials. Um, Entry criteria for reduce it required elevated triglycerides. We've talked about that some, and you all are going to have to decide, and clinicians will need to decide, and the FDA will need to decide uh, whether they believe that this is a triglyceride relevant issue or whether this could be given to people irrespective of triglycerides if they met the other entry criteria. Um, and then 93% of these patients were on statins. This is probably a lipid-affecting drug, even though I was just arguing that it doesn't seem to have been working through its triglyceride effects. If it's a lipid-affecting drug, do we know that it works in people who aren't on moderate or high-intensity statin therapy? And this is a very relevant question because I'm a primary care doctor. My patients all want to take fish oil. They all come in and tell me they've already put themselves on fish oil. I don't think we know whether this works without being on a statin. Um, potential other benefits or disadvantages. Uh, most patients who would be eligible for either of these therapies are already taking multiple classes of medications. And uh, this, you know, imagine that you decided you wanted to put them on both of these therapies to give them two more drugs to take. Uh, it's just an enormous number of drugs that we already send patients home from the hospital with after an MI or with known coronary artery disease. So there's a lot of complexity to deal with there. Um, another potential advantage, though, is that uh, Vasipa may have a really different mechanism of action. Again, we don't quite know what it's doing. Other triglyceride drugs have generally not been beneficial. Um, and it's not clear that this was a triglyceride drug even though we know it reduces triglycerides in people with hypertriglyceridemia. So it may complement other commonly prescribed therapies and be the first drug that's doing that in this mechanism. Uh, for contextual considerations, obviously um, a high-risk population with unmet need, maybe the largest unmet need in the United States if you look at just mortality. Um, high lifetime burden of illness. Uh, 
the early termination of the COMPASS trial uh, introduces uncertainties uh, about both long-term safety and benefits of rivaroxaban. Uh, we got various public comments. I had mentioned um, the uh, total event versus time to event findings. If this comes up again, we can discuss it more, but we felt it was safer to go to the time to first event hazard ratio and apply that to future events rather than believing the total event analysis where events can be correlated. Uh, we got concerns about the appropriateness of comparing rivaroxaban to DAPT. We certainly have evidentiary problems with comparing them, but the manufacturers of the various agents didn't feel they should be compared at all. Um, with the sense that DAPT is typically done right after an MI or in patients who just got a stent, and that rivaroxaban might be a more down-the-road therapy. That said, DAPT has been used at times in this way, and rivaroxaban is being used in patients who've relatively recently had an MI, and both of these are therapies that are clearly causing a trade-off between higher risk of bleeding and lower risk of cardiovascular events. So in that way, they feel similar, and we think it's a fair question. I, I think the question of whether we're able to answer it is a different one. Um, and then lots of people seem to think that because we did both of these in the same report that we were trying to compare rivaroxaban to icosapentethyl, I will just say yet again, we were not trying to compare rivaroxaban to icosapentethyl. There's no particular reason that you couldn't imagine giving both these drugs to the same patient. That just wasn't a question we were asking. So in summary, um, the phase three trial evidence for uh, both of these uh, indicates significant reductions in the risk of MACE in high-risk populations uh, compared to current optimal therapy. Uh, there are residual uncertainties, uh, early trial termination for rivaroxaban, uh, prior negative studies of fish oil for Visipa, and um, uh, biomarker uh, changes in the placebo arm, that's the mineral oil question for Visipa uh, that have raised some concerns. Um, and then that a full comparison of rivaroxaban plus aspirin to dual antiplatelet therapy wasn't feasible because of uh, differences in bleeding definitions. It would be really great if trials could use the same bleeding definitions. Yeah. Uh, so overall, uh, we gave uh, a B plus uh, that is a small or substantial benefit to rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. The B plus, this would be an A if we didn't have concerns about how bleeding really applies in the real world and the trial stopped early for benefit and the fact that this might be used in people who are higher risk for bleeding uh, than was used in the trial. Uh, Vasipa versus optimal medical management, that B plus uh, reflects that um, the concerns that we've had neg negative fish oil studies before. And so, uh, you know, if you believe the Reduce It trial, a 25% reduction would get this an A. There, we felt we still had some uncertainty, and so we said at least a small reduction and maybe a substantial reduction. So that's where those B pluses come from. Rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared with dual antiplatelet therapy, we felt we had insufficient evidence. And so that's the I. Questions? Rachel. So I am curious about the differences in the bleeding definitions between the trials. I'm just wondering if there's a medical reason why the trials would have been designed in this way or even a trial design data collection reason. I'm trying to understand what the motivation was there. If, if there is one, I don't know what it is, but I'm not sure. I mean, it might be that if we ask the manufacturers, they could give us some answer to that, but I have no feel for any good reason, and it's hard to imagine a good enough reason given how helpful it would be if people had used the exact same definitions. Ah, is there a manufacturer who wanted to answer that? Is that what? Um, if it wasn't to answer that question, we should probably let the I'm, panel keep going. That's okay. I wanted to correct there was one minor misstatement. I could do it after. If we can do it after, that'll be good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, thanks. Uh, on the VASIPA, 
are there, is there evidence from the other trials um, that DHA potentially is harmful and would our content experts be able to um, shed some light on whether they thought a priori that these should, that this trial should have been separate from the other fish oil trials? J Jason or Jeremy? Yeah. No, I'm not. <laughs> I, my expertise is not. A little closer to, if you can, just. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not, a, I'm certainly not a lipid biologist, but I, I, I did, I will say that um, Deepak Bhatt, who was the PI on the SEPA trial, um, spoke at our grand rounds last okay. week, and he addressed this issue. The way, so that his view on this is that there are, uh, there is evidence from basic translational science, especially lipid biology, that the interaction between EPA and DHA with the cell membrane is different. So that's been hypothesized as a, I'm not necessarily making the argument, but that, that's the hypothesis for why there's heterogeneous effects within these fish oil trials, as okay. I understand it. Do you know, was that before or after he saw the results? I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it, was, it was the rationale for why they did the study, to be yeah, clear. Okay. I mean, yeah, and, and fish oils were considered approaching dead as a, as, a, as a field because those prior studies had been so poor. And the fact that people thought this was reasonable was how they got the idea to do it. Um, you know, the confusing part with this does remain that the other studies did find a lowering in triglycerides. Right? And so all these studies that found no clinical benefit did find a benefit in lowering triglycerides. And so you are in some way proposing something that's both a different effect and not by the obvious mechanism with which it would happen. And that I have not seen a clear explanation of except for this bio lipid bile, the, the membrane one. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I guess to make that consistent with the other point that's been made about the lack of heterogeneity among the different subsets of triglycerides, that's at least potentially consistent with an EPA direct effect on cardiovascular events. It's not through triglycerides. Um, I don't necessarily mean to argue that, but there's a couple of confusing things here, one of which you pointed out, one of which is the non-heterogeneity in, in triglyceride levels, and that's one potential explanation that would address both. And this is part of what, what you were saying about with the, um, the heterogeneity issue, which is that in general, triglyceride studies have been unimpressive. And so the idea that this amount of triglyceride lowering would have this clinical benefit, not only have the fish oil studies not been consistent with that, the other triglyceride lowering drug therapies have not really been consistent with that either. And so there's still a little bit of mystery in that respect that perhaps the membrane biology could answer, but that's not, not clearly known the way I like to see it. That's great. Kurt, do you have a question? Um, so the aspirin dose in Compass was 100 milligrams. Uh, the typical dose we use here in the United States is 81 or 325, but do you think that would affect the results or not? Um, I, I can turn that over to Jason, but I, I would just say that, you know, there's sort of been a wide range studied of aspirin doses, and there's been a sense that 100 and below is a pretty good dose to be using. Uh, typically, as you go to lower doses, you see less bleeding and you don't see much change in efficacy. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, mean, I think the, the thing that I think has become clear over the last 10 years is that 325, you, you bleed more without a, 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 um, an important reduction in thrombotic endpoints. Um, I guess I'm just trying to think, so right, as, as you point out, we usually use 81, not 100. Um, I, but I think in, in the control group, the dose of aspirin was the same. So I, I, I guess you'd have to invoke uh, that something in all of these patients that the relative effect of the intervention was different. And that, um, it just seems a little bit too complex to, to believe it um, because the doses, as I recall, at least were the same in the intervention and control group. Yeah, I mean, at some level, if you're going to worry about it, you might worry that it overstated the bleeding risk of the therapy. The, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with an explanation why the manufacturer would have wanted to pick a higher bleeding dose of aspirin. So I, I, yeah. okay. Greg. Thank you, David. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, on rivaroxaban, um, you tended to emphasize uh, relative differences in your presentation rather than absolute differences in risk. Um, but in the Compass uh, article in the New England Journal, um, they do uh, look at what they call net clinical benefit, and you referred to that. Um, and 
the absolute difference in net clinical benefit is 1%, uh, 4% versus 3%, roughly. And if you look at figure one in the COMPASS article, which are the Kaplan-Meier curves for the three randomized groups, um, for the primary Excuse endpoint. Excuse me, Greg, could you speak just a little closer to the microphone? I think the sound is having trouble coming through. Thank you. Thank you. The um, curves uh, to the naked eye um, are almost superimposable, to be honest with you. And so uh, what, I'm, what I'm driving at here is, uh, y you know, maybe we should be talking more about the absolute differences here, not just the relative differences. And I wonder if um, um, in preparing the report, a number needed to treat, number needed to harm was calculated. It was not in the New England Journal article. I looked very carefully and uh, I was surprised, but they didn't report that. But yeah, I wonder so if you could comment about these Yeah, the, the number needed to treat is on the order of 80 and the number needed to harm is on the order of 80. It's in that ballpark. Uh, that said, again, I would worry that the number needed to harm, that we may not be treating this. There's always the risk of using the absolute risk reductions, which are, of course, what patients really should care about, but you don't know that they translate over to the baseline risk of the underlying populations, and in particular on the number needed to harm piece, where I'm, I think we have concerns that this was a lower bleeding risk population than you might have in reality, I, I'd hesitate to look at the absolute number because you might have people who are at higher baseline risk of bleeding. Yeah, I mean, sort of driving where you're going, though, of course, this was a pretty sick population. 90% um, had, had CAD, 30% had PAD, 40% had diabetes, and patients at high risk of GI bleed were excluded. So when you think about what this would look like in real world use, where the patients will not be as wisely selected because they never are, those numbers might, if any, would, would most likely get a little bit worse. And so here a situation where you have a sort of one-to-one -one trade off between a less severe bleed and a heart attack or stroke, probably would be even worse than that in practice. Very good. Uh, Don, how about one last question? I think we need to move to the economic model. Sure. And then we can, we can regroup. For Again, more. thank you for this great overview. Um, my question relates to both the enrollment criteria, both, both studies, as well as the subsequent outcome measures related to the uh, patients with MI, which is just put up as as if it's one, uh, one population. And in fact, when we talk about optimal medical therapy, obviously patients with reduced ejection fraction have a lot of other drugs to take. And people who also undergo PCI have a lot of other drugs to take. So to some extent, I'm wondering about whether there are differences, let's say, in infarct size or ejection fraction in any of these populations at, on an, on the enrollment side as well as the outcome side? So um, my recollection is that in the VASIPA trial, um, there was a heart failure um, that people couldn't have substantial heart failure. I'm looking over to make sure that's true, whereas that wasn't a rule for, uh, you, you could have more heart failure going in into the rivaroxaban trial. Okay, you couldn't have severe heart failure and be in the reverse. Well, but heart failure can be caused by preserved DF or reduced DF. So, right. So I'm trying to get at this question. Of I, I, I don't have it. Okay. I don't have it exactly. And again, not everybody, obviously in the VASIPA trial, many of those patients had not had an infarct. Okay. Thank you very Good. much. Thank you. Thanks, David. So, I am Brett McQueen. I'm an assistant professor at University of Colorado a School of Pharmacy, and I'll be talking about the cost effectiveness for this project. I would like to acknowledge, of course, my uh, colleagues, John Campbell, who's right here, Taryn Quinlan back at Colorado, and we have Mel Whittington in the back, who's also a team member, uh, who did not participate in this, but it's great to have the whole team here. Um, also, just want to acknowledge not only the financial uh, support, but the collaborative support from ICER. 
Uh, we always enjoy these projects and uh, really appreciate the work that they do with us and uh, no conflicts to disclose uh, otherwise. So our objective uh, for this project was to estimate the cost effectiveness of river oxaban uh, and vasipa separately, uh, so we're not comparing them, as additive therapies to optimal medical management in patients with established cardiovascular, but then in the case of vasipa, we're also including that high risk uh, population not necessarily established. So our modeling method really relies on the chronic nature of the cardiovascular, uh, of cardiovascular disease. So we use a Markov cohort approach over the full lifetime for these simulated patients uh, with a cycle length of one year, which represents these events, the recovery from the, the events, and then the management uh, of those events. Now our, our primary outcome is cost per quality adjusted life year gained, and I'm just gonna remind everyone, a quality adjusted life year combines both quantity as well as quality of life. But ICER has introduced a new measure, equal value of life years gained, which we've also included. And that actually, any sort of life extension, so there is a quality of life component there, but any extension in life is valued uh, equally. So it's, it's valued at a population norm. There's no decrement for any events if they survive for stroke or MI. And we can get into that a little bit later in the results. You'll see what I mean uh, uh, about small differences between that and the cost per quality gain. And then, of course, we also include life years gain, which is only the quantity uh, of life. So this is a model schematic just to give you an idea, a very basic idea of how the model works. So we start, as I talked about, our indicated population, established or high-risk cardiovascular disease. There is a risk of having an event, and they stay in that event state for one year. We call that a tunnel state. Uh, and in this case, we have MI or stroke. They, uh, are in that state, which is characterized by a disutility or decrement to their health-related quality of life, as well as cost to actually manage those complications. Once they're through that, that cycle, they move to a post-event state, assuming that they survive, and that is also characterized by a decrement to their health-related quality of life and management costs for uh, having that stroke or MI. Uh, of course, what, what else is uh, the other the point of the, the three-point maze, excuse me, is CV-specific death. So uh, we include all cause, but CV-specific death was a very uh, key uh, point here uh, in this modeling analysis. Now, of course, uh, we, David talked a lot about the three-point maze, but we also did a scenario analysis that included that five-point maze, which uh, is revascularization and unstable angina. Just a few key model assumptions. Really, they, they really are a function of the clinical evidence that David just uh, presented that flows into the model. So the first key assumption would be individual hazard ratios for the three-point maze. So we could have used, say, a composite endpoint where they're all combined. In this case, we wanted to see the, the change uh, across all three uh, uh, endpoints that, that were presented in the trials. The subsequent events, which we count, uh, second, third, and fourth events. So patients, of course, have uh, a risk of additional events, but we use that same hazard ratio from the first event. David covered that a little bit in some of the controversies and uncertainties. And our third here is that we allow patients to have more than one event in the same cycle, uh, but uh, our assumption is that it's additive instead of uh, maybe opposed to some sort of average uh, approach. So we begin using validated uh, risk equations from the Framingham cohort. I'm sure everyone's uh, relatively familiar with that, but it's really only used to actually calculate the events. Uh, what we did was calibrate the control arm from COMPASS and separately from the REDUCE-IT trial to see is the model predicting exactly how the trial, over the duration of the trial, we have the model calibrated so it predicts exactly what's shown in the placebo arm. We then apply the treatment and event-specific hazard ratios to the treatment arm of the model, and then that allows us to see the differences in those events over time and how they add up over an entire lifetime. So then we extrapolate over the lifetime. You can see those individual hazard ratios in the evidence summary and report. You should have that uh, right in front of you. We also include discontinuation. So if a patient discontinues, not, they do not incur the cost, but they also do not incur the benefit. Uh, and then any sort of serious adverse events, we also assigned a cost and disutility. So those negative, uh, potential negative outcomes are included for both placebo as well as uh, the comparator arm. 
Treatment costs begin with uh, establishing the, the wholesale acquisition cost, which we look up in Red Book. So you'll see for River Oxaban, it was approximately $750 per tablet. For Vesipa, $250. And then we use estimates from uh, net pricing estimates from SSR Health to uh, reduce that net, net price per dose and then extrapolate over the entire year what it would cost uh, for a fully adherent population. So for River Oxaban, that's approximately $2,200 per year, and then for Vesipa, approximately 1,600 per year. In order to calculate quality adjusted life years as well as equal value of life years gained, we of course need to start with health utility scores. So you'll see the treated population without observed events is about 0.854, but then from there, any type of event, any type of uh, moving past that event into a post-stroke or MI uh, state, are characterized by decrements to their health utility. So you see there's a little summation with the event. That means they had the event and they're living with that in that same year. So there's sort of the double uh, decrement to your health-related quality of life. And then in the post-event state, we see that chronic disutility of, of having uh, an MI or stroke previously. We also include disutilities, as I said, for uh, uh, adverse events. So that could be major bleeding, um, male, as we just uh, spoke, to, spoke about. I don't have to say that out. I, I don't, the female's not included, my apologies. Uh, and then severe AFib is also another uh, potential. These affect both placebo as well as the comparator arms. So let's jump into the results. Uh, this actually, somebody just asked about absolute difference, right? So this is kind of uh, the model output can kind of inform this absolute difference. So let's start first with medical management in the middle row. So these are results over a lifetime that are undiscounted for river oxaban. And really what we did, again, was calibrate that arm, the placebo arm, to the trial duration cumulative incidence. We then extrapolate over a lifetime and then you see that's really the result of that, the, the cumulative incidence over a lifetime for medical management. Then once we apply the hazard ratios, we can calculate relative differences, absolute differences, and that's what you see in this case, where the first event MI, stroke, we see a 1% difference over a lifetime, 4% for stroke, and then for death, 5%. The cumulative CV events, they don't add up because cumulative CV events actually include the subsequent two, three, four uh, MI and stroke events. So we see river oxaban versus medical management alone, that difference about 11% over a lifetime. For Vasipa, again, that medical management arm was calibrated during the trial duration and then extrapolated over the lifetime. Once we apply those hazard ratios, we see a first event MI difference of about 6%. Uh, stroke of about 2%, death of 8%, and then including those subsequent events, a total absolute difference over a lifetime of about 17% of, of complications. Okay? So, of course, as I said, we're avoiding these events, right, through our, our treatment hazard ratios, through our efficacy estimates from the trial, and there will be cost offsets, we would expect, at least. And that's in that middle row of non-intervention costs, where you have uh, complications, uh, in management of the disease, of these uh, events. And so that's where River Oxaban actually has a cost offset component versus medical management alone. But of course, that comes at a higher cost in the intervention. Now, we talked a little bit about this this morning, but River Oxaban is really plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. We obviously acknowledge some of these patients are on other therapies, but for including them in the model, we really had to make a decision about restricting what's in our placebo arm. So overall, we see an increase in total cost, but we also see an increase in effectiveness across all three measures, both with quantity of life, so life years gained, equal value of life years gained, as well as quality adjusted life years gained. For Vesipa, we see uh, the Vesipa plus statins versus statins alone in the far left column. Those are the costs over the lifetime. The non-intervention costs, so we're seeing a cost offset component which we would expect from those absolute differences that I just presented for Vesipa, and that overall we have an increase in cost, but again, there's an increase in effectiveness across all three measures, life years gained, equal value of life years gained, and then quality adjusted uh, life years gained. 
And so let's see how this works out in terms of the incremental results. So focus first on the top row, rivaroxaban versus medical management alone. So you see that increase in cost and then increase in effectiveness for our primary outcome of 36,000 per quality adjusted life year gain. Now, equal value of life year gain slightly lower, right? Why is that? Well, that's because the life extension component is there are no decrements to their quality of life for surviving but having a stroke, having an MI. So they're valued at a population norm. We'd expect then that that should drop slightly down below the quality adjusted life year gain. So then let's look at Visipa, the next row. Uh, again, there's an increase in cost, increase in effectiveness. We'll see about a half a, a perfect year of life for our primary outcome of 18,000 per per quality adjusted life year gained. Again, that's per perfect year of life, right? Perfectly healthy year of life. And then again, that life extension component, there's no decrement for any of these events. They're valued equally, and therefore uh, that, that ratio drops just slightly uh, below what we expected in the primary. In terms of key drivers for the model, as expected, they would be the three-point uh, MACE endpoint, right? Uh, you see the uh, relative risk, uh, the first one in terms of rivaroxaban of non-fatal MI, then non-fatal stroke and CV death. Those are really the three key drivers. And what this is showing is that once we varied one, we kept every other input constant, what happens to our model result, uh, in this case, cost per quality adjusted life year gain. So one thing I think to note is even when we see really low efficacy estimates, so those estimates way above, all the way over to the right, are using the higher end of the hazard ratio. And we're still seeing those drop uh, really similar or near that 50,000 per quality adjusted life year gain threshold. And then for VASIPA, uh, again, we have the three-point MACE as really the key drivers. There are some other inputs, uh, certainly, that are important, but those are really the, the key drivers. And again, you see, look all the way to the right, even at low levels of efficacy, we're still seeing our estimate well below uh, 50,000 per quality adjusted life year gained versus medical management alone for VASIPA. So that shows us individual inputs and how we vary those inputs and, and what happens once we uh, hold everything else constant in the model. But what if we varied all of them simultaneously and repeated the model calculation thousands of times? That's what we're showing here. We take the proportion of all of those draws from the model and then see which ones fell below uh, 50,000 per quality adjusted life year, 100 and 150,000 per quality adjusted life year. So focus on the top row for river oxaban, 92% cost effective at 50,000 per quality adjusted life year gain. And as we move further up the threshold uh, chain, we see it increase to 100%. Uh, for Fazipa, we see again uh, about 100% starting at 50,000 and then it increases uh, or it stays the same all the way up to 150,000. So of course we have limitations. I think number one, uh, this gets back to efficacy versus effectiveness. The model doesn't account for uh, adherence, persistence on therapies. Uh, so really when we, when we talk about this, we're really looking at the clinical trial population and extrapolating those results over a long run without the use of, of real world evidence. Uh, we did have, you know, we modeled subsequent events in terms of second, third, and fourth, so they were all counted in the numerator and the denominator, but we didn't ne necessarily build the history to differentiate those, and that's a key point uh, that came up in the public comments, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, on the next slide. And then, of course, we didn't include any uh, price changes, disruptions, alternative uh, interventions over time in, in the model. So the comments, the main comments received were really uh, for, for the first one, the, for VASIPA, the three-point versus the five-point MACE. Uh, there was, David talked a little bit about this, that there's a little unmeasured correlation between, say, MI and revascularization. There is a scenario analysis in your packet that shows uh, when we include the five-point MACE, that uh, incremental cost-effectiveness ratio drops slightly. Uh, and then there was some concern over how subsequent events were modeled. I just talked a little bit about that and the limitations. Uh, we did model it. They were included in the numerator and the denominator. And you saw that on the long-term outcomes, right? You saw how that was slightly different. They didn't all add up because we did include the additional estimates. And then some heterogeneity, of course, not every stroke is going to be the same in terms of severity. And the public comments were actually quite helpful because when we use the estimates that the public comment uh, uh, group 
provided to us, we actually ended up using a more severe health utility, uh, dish utility score, excuse me, uh, than what was presented to us in the public comments. So just to conclude, uh, River Oxavan and Vasipa provide gains both in quality adjusted and overall survival uh, over uh, optimal medical management alone. And then the costs with either uh, River Oxavan or Vasipa, again, separately, fall uh, well below commonly cited thresholds for cost effectiveness. So, questions, questions from the CPAC panel or our clinical experts if you, and patient so if you'd like to ask any questions. Bijan. Yep. Uh, so I have a question regarding the the health system perspective that you adopted, mm -hmm. and in there, uh, sort of, you know, the, can you clarify when you say health system perspective, what exactly it means? Is it uh, uh, sort of an you know, pair or the manufacturer, or like, you know, what exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, it's largely the payer perspective. Um, now, the health system perspective is stated that way because there are cost offsets in the health system that aren't directly or could directly be related to the payer. But we do also include a societal perspective in the in your um, Senior, packet. I believe it's Senior in the tables Vienna. there. So, so in general, we're looking at it from the payer perspective. But I think on that, the reason why I'm asking is it seems you use you ended up using uh, data net, data on net prices from SSR Health, mm -hmm. and those net prices. I mean, I might be wrong, but they actually refer to the net price to the manufacturers, right? I mean, that's the net price paid by the payer to the manufacturer, right? It, that's my confusion. So, I don't know. So SSR, what SSR knows is how much money the manufacturer received. Um, so there's the money the payer paid. There's other people along the way who took chunks out. And there's the money the manufacturer received. Yep. So it doesn't perfectly align to the extent that some other places money has come out, but it's probably much closer than assuming the list price, which isn't what the manufacturer is receiving and what, and it isn't what the payer is paying. So that's the reason that we look at the SSR numbers. We can, we're typically not able to know exactly what the payer is paying, what the PBM took, what, you know, yep. what various, play, what rebate cards were given to patients. What we can know is what the manufacturer um, reported on their public disclosures that they received. So if I may ask, so on that, then I think they, it would depend uh, like in terms of your sensi sensitivity analysis. So how wide were the costs? Like, you know, I mean, what was the basis of your r uh, ranges for costs when you actually conducted the? You mean for price? Yeah, yeah for price. Yeah, yeah, well, for price, we usually do the, the threshold comparison. And so that's why you saw the one-way sensitivity analysis and the probabilistic analysis. And then there's even the threshold price to meet each one of those thresholds. So instead of, as David put it, trying to accurately figure out what the actual price is, which varies across, and what I meant by payer is exactly what David said, that payer can mean a lot of different things. PBMs are involved, a variety of different parties. And so I would look towards the threshold to see the threshold estimates to see what price could they potentially charge to meet those thresholds in terms of net price. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that the tornado di diagrams you, you presented, though, displayed price sensitivity. As no, a, they don't. Okay, no, just, and, and just that's, to clarify that's that a, that that's was a, not yeah. presented. Yes, they're yeah. not. 4.24. Yeah, but it's thanks. in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, Don. Yes, thanks. This is hopefully quick. Um, in the um, transition probabilities, what were the sources of the CD risk equations that you used to uh, uh, estimate? Controlling. Yeah, there's a. I'm uh, curious because in practice, uh, those might not be congruent with what's more likely. Sure, yeah. If, 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 yeah, if that wasn't clear, what I was saying earlier on the, the uh, transition probability slide was that we took, we used the Framingham risk equation. So the actual paper is D'Agostino from 2008. And we just used the risk equation to actually calculate the event based on age other risk factors, but then we calibrated the model to the COMPASS trial, 
for rivaroxaban, and then separately the reduce it trial for Vasipa. So, so that we're we're looking at the placebo arms cumulative incidence through those trials. That's actually a benefit of these trials. Usually we only have like LDL, right? Or we only have some intermediate outcome. In this case, we actually have the hard MACE endpoints. So, so it's somewhat accurate to say we use the framing of risk equations, but then we, we tailored them or calibrated them to the, the trial, what we observed in the trials. Yeah, yeah go ahead, uh, Jason. Uh, Thank you so much, it was a great uh, presentation. I, I had a question because it seems like that you had referenced that there was some different uh, input that you got about the, the utility weights associated with the post-stroke state. So it, from what I can see here, you know, I, just to state the obvious, this is you know, very, it looks very cost effective, so I'm just trying to uh, understand the bounding of those, that specific yeah. stroke state, because that should be influential, I would imagine, in the main results. It says it's a negative uh, point Two zero four is the disutility applied to the post-stroke state in the model, but it sounds. I just. What were the other inputs? That yeah, you that's had? a good question, and I'd have to look back at the at the comments. But there were a variety of different ranges across the stroke severity for disutility, yeah, it's hard to and do. yeah, that and that was the challenge. Is it's hard to you know we're trying to come up with one or or two at most value-based right. prices, right? So uh, w the idea is that we can do some sort of weighted average across what's the, the proportion of people in these yeah. different stroke states, and then we weight those. Those are the weights for the mean disutility estimates. And when we did that from the public comments, it found we found that that estimate that we used was actually more severe than what we used for the weighted average. So we stuck with the original estimate just to be a little bit more conservative about our assumption that you know, it'd be a little slightly severe than, than a simple weighted average. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Tim. Uh, thank both of you for communicating complex concepts clearly. Um, two things. One, are you going to be presenting the budget impact um, issues? Is that going to be? That, that's, that's ICER in-house. Okay, we'll, we'll be presenting that later. I think we'll talk about that in the policy. Yeah. In the okay, policy sorry. Segment. Okay. Uh, and then maybe the, uh, our clinical content experts or others will be able to let us know, and I guess it gets at some of the things that Greg and others have commented on, uh, this net benefit. Whether the populations in these studies, um, how this would extrapolate out into clinical practice, because I can see this being the camel's nose under the tent and you, you look at these studies and their, you know, running periods, early stopping, exclusionary things, how that might affect some of these assumptions. Yeah, yeah and I, I think that I tried to preface your question a little bit on the one-way sensitivity analysis because when you look at the upper level of the hazard ratio, so certainly we're in this world where our best guess, which may be inflated, is these reductions that, that you see in front of you in the tables for the hazard ratios. But what if our best guess actually was a little bit higher up? And that's where the one-way sensitivity analysis can, can help us, at least in terms of the individual MACE endpoints. The other way we could also look at that as the composite endpoint, whether the, the upper level of the confidence interval for the hazard ratio. And what we saw from these one-way sensitivity analyses, at least the, the ones that I presented, was as you get the lower and lower efficacy, we're still seeing at the price, at the net price, there's, they're cost-effective in terms of being lower than commonly cited thresholds, such as 50,000 per quality adjusted life year. So I understand that your question goes beyond uh, more into clinical uncertainty, but at least from a modeling perspective, that's, that's where we're coming from. So do you want to add Tim, anything to that? No. I mean, for what it's worth, the run and excluded 8% of the patients, which isn't a particularly big number. Um, the, the best sort of statistical simulations I've seen have shown that the, the bias attributable to early stopping shouldn't be very big. Steve Goodman did a paper on that like 10 years ago. But yeah, I mean, you know, to me, the biggest concern is always is who's going to end up using it. And none of us mm -hmm. can answer that. Right. Tim. Yeah, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I wanted you to comment on the subsequent events, the hazard ratio mm -hmm. issue, which was raised. Um, I understand from what I read and what you said that you did model subsequent events. You modeled it at the same hazard ratio. Yeah. Is that correct? Did yep. you um, have any evidence or did you try to model it at any different rate? 
Yeah, for breaks. That, that was more of a clinical decision, but I think ultimately, or at least the way I think about it, and David, please feel free to jump in or anyone else, but the way I think about it is, you know, would we really see the benefit if, say, somebody had a, an event or had two events, and then you put them on Vasipo or then you put them on River Oxman, would you really see the benefit that, that we were showing downstream? I don't know. It's really hard to answer. But one of the, the easiest assumption or the most conservative assumption we can make is to say that they'll get the first event benefit. And, you know, I don't know if you want to expand on that. That's the way I think about it, but it, there's also clinical uncertainty here as well. So I, I guess what I would say is that over and over again, people have used the method of assuming that the first, that, that that's the number that we most trust out of these trials. And that total event calculations that try to use something other than that assumption that it's the first hazard ratio over and over again for the future events haven't been what most people have done. So even if you looked, if you wanted to compare it to what do people think about statins or what do they think about aspirin, um, even if this calculation were correct, I'd worry that it was being done in a different way from how we've typically looked at other drugs in the past. So that, that, that would be my argument for it. That it, it's of course possible that Vasipa, because of its different mechanism, has an escalating reduction in events in a way that doesn't happen with other drugs, but I don't think we have any way of knowing that. There is this, there is this, um, this is referenced extensively in the report, and, and then yeah, there's, a Jack, there's a Jack paper by Dr. Bott about recurrent events in the SEPA, and, and so, um, you know, as the report really nicely <laughs> but 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 th that is correct. The, you know the, the ICE report does a really good job of articulating these statistical issues that that made. But I will say none of that makes me lose sleep about the decisions that you guys right. have to make right. because right. if anything, if if the rates are more reduced over time and recurrent for Vasepa, that doesn't change the overall. Uh, it's, the, the main conclusions of the analysis, the cost effective analysis, are not changed. But if anything, it'll make it more cost effective. Yep. Right. Um, but I but I think that. Um, there's a very thoughtful uh, treatment of this in the, in the, in the ICE report, but it shouldn't change the overall result. Thanks for your time. Okay. Any other thoughts? I have, I have one question, and if the patient, uh, our patient panelists would like to, to comment on this. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make sense. So it's wonderful to see um, five-figured quality of life adjusted years. We haven't seen uh, many of those with just five integers. So that's good. Um, I think that Greg and others are raising a, an interesting and notable concern regarding the absolute, uh, the absolute effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so on Roxman in particular, when we look at the life years gained in the model, and I'll just focus on the model, right? It turns out that it's about a five-month difference Right, so in terms of the life, well, so if you take 10.86 uh, of life years gained oh, versus 10.45, sure. yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. if I convert mm -hmm. that yeah. into the way patients and families will think about the possible incremental benefit of this particular treatment, regardless of cost, right? Um, debates around kitchen tables, for example, of whether I'm gonna put a family member on a particular treatment in oncology has something sometimes to do with the number of years you know, gained. So, I think that it's, it's effective. We have statistical significance. We have a very large sample size. It's an unreplicated study, so, mm -hmm. but, it, but it comes from a solid base of evidence in my assessment. But how do we make sense or communicate clearly you know, this benefit that we notice that's not enormous, right? It is one percentage point in terms of absolute, or if you think about it in terms of life years gained, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of not a year, but five months on average. Mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm trying to... I'm trying to turn this fact into how do we communicate this and how does this end up affecting the way patients perceive and, and receive this information? So that's kind of a, a question maybe to, the, to Andrea and to Marie if you have any thoughts on this or to others. So I think that, can, 
it's really important to understand each individual patient and what you're looking at in terms of extending the quality or extending the life and is it the quality of life you're looking at or is it just months and, and days I I don't think that as a, a physician who is speaking to a patient you would need to or you should talk in terms of well this might extend your life five months or eight months or you know I think that the more important thing is are you looking at improving the quality of their life during this period of time that they're here and what it's going to do affecting the family in that period of time, not specifically in, well, we're going to extend your life for five months. Um, I think one of the important things that we're noting when we're talking about especially the cost effectiveness is are we looking at a pure cost effectiveness in the real world and I don't think that what we're including in that, and maybe we are, and I should ask the question, is are we including family members who are having to take off of work to care for the people who are a part of this, um, or family members who are having to travel to take care of their loved one, to take them to the doctors, and those types of things. Um, if we're improving the quality of life in and, and those five months, and they're not, or the eight months or the year, and they're not having adverse effects or more um, adverse events, are we redu or reducing the burden overall of the economic burden of the family members who are also taking care of them? And so I think that that's important to think about as well. Right, and, and I want to be clear, like it's not just five months, it's the incremental over, right. over a much larger benefit from the total, total benefit of the therapy. But Marie, did you have any? Agree. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't, Jason or Jeremy, do I? I just I speak briefly on this. I think um, Steve's uh, intro slide really resonated with me. Is that you know when people just as a clinician, when people have these things, you know, a Sentinel MI and a youngish person, like that's everything. The, the questions are always, uh, what are the chances this is going to happen again, and how do we reduce the risk? And, and right. I think um, you know my um, my dad had a heart attack when I was eleven, and that was the thing that they were. Kids, a lot, this could happen to people in their fifties. Um, you know, the, the kids are worried, the spouse is worried, the um, everyone's worried, and that's the sort of thing that um, that that's what everyone asks. Um, so I think the the notion that um, some agents may reduce the risk of recurrent myocardial infarction directly addresses, in, in my clinical experience and in my personal experience, what the people are concerned about. My dad had a heart attack thirty years ago, and it was everything was different. Right. All the therapy, Dr. Kirk, I'm more senior cardiologist here. You know, I, I think you know the therapies were totally different, and so the the, the reduction in mortality uh, for recurrent you know, for, for Sentinel MI and the reduction rate of subsequent MI over the last few decades in America is an astonishing success right. story. Can I? Yeah, no, please. Too, I, 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 as well, and so I also share some of your, you know, because my uh, father had some heart problems a little while ago and he's alive and it's great but it, it is there is that sort of anxiety behind it could have happened at any time so I really did appreciate that slide as well Steve but from a modeling perspective that you said that the five months but I think this is why the quality adjusted life here is actually important and I know right. some people disagree but it does include the quality of life difference and it's not just survival it's also you survived without having a heart attack a stroke, yeah. without having a stroke and I, I think I think that's important to, to also consider that and and that's why we present three effectiveness outcomes well and I appreciate you one. I appreciate you making that point I think that that in this particular case we highlight the value of of thinking about qualities in, in lieu of just uh, life extension. So thank you. And the modified societal perspective, excuse me, does include some lost productivity estimates, just to follow up. 